Thank you for joining us on this brisk fall evening for an event that will provide some much needed historical context regarding a variety of subjects looming large on the minds of many at this time, three weeks out from the midterm elections. My name is Scott St. Louis and I have the privilege of serving as program manager for the Common Ground Initiative at the Howenstein Center. On behalf of our director, Gleaves Whitney, and everyone on staff, we welcome you to Lucemore Auditorium with gratitude and excitement. We are particularly thankful for the Howenstein family members here tonight, as well as Annette Kirk of the Russell Kirk Center for Cultural Renewal, which serves as a frequent partner for Howenstein Center events. We also thank our current and former public officials and university trustees, members of the Grand Valley Senior Management Team, and the deans of our wonderful colleges for being here. We appreciate your committed stewardship of our democratic institutions, and we are grateful to everyone who supports the Howenstein Center for your participation in Colonel Ralph Howenstein's vision of ethical, effective leadership for the 21st century. Let's give him a round of applause. With your help, we are proudly continuing our efforts to build community around shared access to top-tier civic education in our needful time. Before making introductions this evening, I want to provide you with some important logistical information. We will be doing our Q&A session this evening on the note cards provided over by the doors. Please be sure to write your questions down as they come to mind during tonight's event. At the end of George Nash's formal presentation, he will be joined on stage by Howenstein Center Director Gleaves Whitney for around 15 to 20 minutes of conversation. At that time, please hold your note cards up in the air and a member of the Howenstein Center staff will come and collect them from you. Okay. Now the fun can begin. As many of you know, the Howenstein Center has three important roles. We are a presidential study center, we are home to the Common Ground Initiative, and we are a center for leadership excellence. Our Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy is currently providing more than 60 student fellows with rigorous educational and professional development opportunities. Many of you already know that we enjoy sharing the stage with our fellows at Howenstein Center events. In fact, our Leadership Minute series has given some of these students a chance to share the experiences that drew them to the academy, how the academy has shaped their growth as leaders, and what they plan to do in the future with what they've learned at the Howenstein Center. Tonight's Leadership Minute will be given by one of our graduate students, Hannah Everett. Please help me welcome Hannah. My name is Hannah Everett, and I am a first year Cook Leadership Academy Fellow. I've always been the quiet person in a room, constantly branded as timid and shy, when in reality, I was just introverted. Growing up, I was taught that leaders had to be audacious, fierce, and loud, that they had to be able to command a room. I had always believed this to be true until I started pushing myself outside of my comfort zone. That started when I taught English in China for a month, Upon my return, I joined various campus groups and started volunteering for nonprofit organizations in my community. Now, as a fellow in the academy, I'm stepping even farther outside of my comfort zone. In the two short months that I've been a part of this program, I've participated in self-reflection seminars and attended wheelhouse talks and common ground initiative events. I've been challenged by my peers to think differently about leadership and to question everything I once thought to be true. I've engaged with local and national leaders who have taught me that there are many ways to approach leadership and that the world needs all kinds. In December, I'm graduating with my master's in public administration, and I hope to eventually become an executive director of a nonprofit that focuses on mental health in West Michigan. <laughs> my experiences in the academy have taught me that I do not have to be loud to be a good leader. Instead, I can focus on my strengths and be thoughtful, collaborative, and creative. My name is Hannah Everett, and I am a leader. It's now my pleasure to introduce George H. Nash, distinguished historian and pioneering interpreter of American conservatism. Hailing originally from Massachusetts, Dr. Nash graduated from Amherst College and earned his PhD in history from Harvard University. His first book, The Conservative Intellectual Movement in America Since 1945, remains the foundational work for understanding how libertarians, traditionalists and anti-communists forged a powerful coalition that shaped the politics and culture of the United States in the second half of the 20th century. This book has occupied a commanding position in the landscape of American historical scholarship for more than 40 years. For more than two decades, Dr. Nash lived in Iowa near the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, where he prepared three commissioned volumes for a definitive scholarly biography of our 31st president under the general title, The Life of Herbert Hoover, published by Norton. <laughs> 
His biography drew upon hundreds of manuscript collections and archival sources in the United States, Canada, Europe, and Australia. And to this day, they are considered to be the standard works for the periods of Hoover's life they cover. In fact, Dr. Nash presented the first two volumes of this biography to President Ronald Reagan in ceremonies in the Oval Office. Alongside Director Gleaves Whitney, Dr. Nash is a senior fellow at the Russell Kirk Center for Cultural Renewal in Macosta, Michigan. A longtime friend of the Howenstein Center, he's been associated with our work in various capacities since 2004. Please help me welcome George Nash back to Grand Rapids. Well, thank you, Scott, for that very gracious introduction, and good evening, everyone. It is both an honor and a pleasure to be again at the Howenstein Center, where I've had that honor to attend and be part of proceedings here for a number of years since the inception of the center. And I want to thank you, Gleaves, and your associates and colleagues, Scott and others, for your unfailing hospitality and the courtesies that you have extended to me. And it is truly a pleasure to be on this platform again. As was intimated, um, I am from Massachusetts, where it has been said that Democrats are Democrats, and so are the Republicans. Um, an observation that may, may or may not be relevant to the lecture that follows. Several years ago, the New York Times technology columnist, David Pogue, listed the five stages of grieving when you lose your computer files. <laughs> Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and moving to Amish country. <laughs> it sounds like a fair description of the mood gripping many American conservatives during the 19, six, or 2016 election season. And it sounds like a description of the mood of many on the American left ever since. Well, what is happening on the American right? Have conservatives lost their computer files? To understand American conservatism's present travails and reconfiguration, we need to understand how the present came to be. This evening, as a historian, I propose to do this through a lens that may not be familiar to some of you, the intellectual history of American conservatism since the Second World War, when the conservative community as we know it took form. Perhaps the most important fact to assimilate about modern American conservatism is that it, it is not and has never been monolithic. It is a coalition, a coalition built around ideas that developed after World War II in response to challenge from the left. The coalition eventually grew to comprise five distinct groupings. First, libertarians and classical liberals who believed in free market capitalism and who opposed overweening bureaucratic government and the ever-expanding welfare state. Second, traditionalist conservatives such as Russell, Russell Kirk, whose 100th birthday we will take note of and celebrate later this week. People like Kirk and others appalled by the weakening of the moral, spiritual, and institutional foundations of American society and Western civilization at the hands they believed of secular, relativistic, desiccated liberalism. Third, anti-communists focused on the titanic Cold War struggle against the evil empire of Soviet communism, as Ronald Reagan called it. Fourth, Neoconservatives, disillusioned former liberals and socialists who had been mugged by reality, as Irving Kristol put it, and who gravitated into the conservative camp in the 1970s and 1980s. And fifth, the so-called religious right, or as we say now, social conservatives, appalled by what they regarded as the moral wreckage unleashed upon America by the courts and by the culture wars during the 1960s and beyond. Each of these components of the conservative revival shared something, a deep antipathy to 20th century liberalism. The alliance was led and personified by two extraordinary leaders, the founder of National Review Magazine, William F. Buckley, Jr., and a little later, Ronald Reagan, both of whom performed an ecumenical function 
giving each branch of the coalition a seat at the table and a sense of having arrived. I need not dwell upon the many steps by which conservative intellectuals and the politicians who became aligned with them moved from the fringes to the mainstream of American life after World War II. But one point deserves to be emphasized. The multifaceted conservative coalition that arose after 1945 was a Cold War phenomenon. The presence in the world of a dangerous external enemy, the Soviet Union, the mortal foe of liberty and tradition, of freedom and religious faith, was a crucial unifying cement for the emerging conservative movement. The life and death stakes of the Cold War helped to curb the temptations of libertarians and traditionalists to absolutize their competing insights and go their separate ways. Since the end of the Cold War in the 1990s, one of the hallmarks of conservative history has been the reappearance of factional strains in the Grand Alliance. One source of rancor has been the ongoing dispute between the so-called neoconservatives and their libertarian and non-interventionist critics over post-Cold War foreign policy, especially in the Middle East. Another fault line has divided lifestyle libertarians and social conservatives on such issues as the legalization of marijuana and same-sex marriage, as we all know. Aside from these built-in philosophical tensions, two fundamental facts of political life have contributed to the recrudescence of intramural debates on the right in recent years. The first is what we may call the perils of prosperity. Since the late 1970s, prosperity has come to conservatism, and with it, a multitude of think tanks and specialization on a thousand fronts, a burgeoning conservative counterculture from the beltway to the blogosphere. But with this prosperity and institutional growth has also come sibling rivalry, increasing tribalism, and a weakening of what I call movement consciousness, that is a sense that you're a part of a larger movement, a team as various elements in the coalition pursue their separate and at times divergent agendas. The vast right-wing conspiracy, as Hillary Clinton once called it, has grown too large for any single institution or magazine, like National Review in its early days, to serve as the movement's gatekeeper and general staff. No longer does American conservatism have a commanding ecumenical figure like Buckley or Reagan. Underlying these centrifugal impulses is a phenomenon that did not exist 25 years ago, what the late Charles Krauthammer called the hyper-democracy of social media. In the ever-expanding universe of cyberspace, no one can be an effective gatekeeper because there are no gates. The second fundamental fact of political life that permitted the renewal of friction on the right was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the stunning end of the Cold War in the early 1990s. Inevitably, the question then arose, could a movement so identified with anti-communism survive the disappearance of the communist adversary in the Kremlin. Without a common foe upon whom to concentrate their minds, it has become easier for former allies on the right to drift apart and succumb to the bane of all coalitions, the sectarian temptation. It is an indulgence made infinitely easier by the internet. The conservative intellectual movement, of course, did not vanish in the 1990s. Nevertheless, it is undeniable 
that unyielding anti-communism supplied much of the glue for the post-1945 conservative coalition, and that the demise of communism in Europe weakened the imperative for conservatives to find common ground and stick together. One of the earliest signs of this was the rise in the 1980s and early 90s of an outspoken group of conservative traditionalists who took the label paleoconservatives. Initially, paleoconservatism was primarily a response to the growing prominence in conservative ranks of the former liberals and social democrats known as neoconservatives. To angry paleocons, led by Patrick Buchanan, among others, the neocons were interlopers, who, despite their recent movement toward the right, remained at heart crusading Wilsonian internationalists abroad and believers in the welfare state at home. In other words, the paleos argued, not true conservatives at all. As the Cold War faded, paleoconservatism introduced a discordant note into the conservative conversation. Fiercely and defiantly nationalist rather than internationalist, skeptical of global democracy as they called it, and of post-Cold War entanglements overseas, fearful of the impact of third world immigration on America's historically Europe-centered culture, and openly critical of the doctrine of global free trade, Buchananite paleoconservatism increasingly resembled much of the American right before 1945, before, that is, the onset of the Cold War. When Buchanan himself campaigned for president in 1992 under the pre-World War II isolationist banner of America First, the symbolism seemed deliberate and complete. Despite the initial furor surrounding the paleoconservatives, they have remained a relatively small faction within the conservative community of discourse. Still, as the post-Cold War epoch settled in during the 90s and beyond, they were not alone among conservatives in searching for new sources of unity. Thus, the first term of President Bill Clinton saw the rise of the Leave Us Alone Coalition, united in its detestation of intrusive government in the form of higher taxes, Hillary Clinton's health care plan, and gun control. Not long thereafter, a number of second-generation neoconservatives associated with the Weekly Standard issued a plea for a new conservatism of national greatness, an adumbration of the muscular foreign policy of President George W. Bush. Bush himself, before he became president, championed what he called compassionate conservatism, in part a deliberate rebuke of the anti-statist thrust of the Leave Us Alone movement. For a time after the trauma of 9-11, the global war on terrorism became for most conservatives the functional equivalent of the late Cold War against communism. More recently, there has been much discussion in conservative circles of constitutional conservatism, reform conservatism, and crunchy conservatism, among other formulations of what conservatives should stand for in a new era. American conservatism, then, has remained at heart a coalition, albeit at times a fractious one. Like all coalitions, it contains within itself the potential for splintering, and never more so than right now. For as the Cold War and its familiar polarities recede from public memory, new challenges and conflicts have been filling the vacuum. Consider this datum. More people are now on the move in the world than at any time in the history of the human race and more and more of them are making America their destination, nearly 20 million since the year 2000. 
The number of international students attending American colleges and universities now exceeds one million per year, more than triple what it was in 1980. In addition, the United States is now admitting more than a million immigrants into permanent legal residence every year, more than any other nation in the world. This unprecedented intermingling, not just of goods and services, but of peoples and cultures, is accelerating, with consequences that we have barely begun to fathom. Among them, the rise in the past 20 years of a post-national, even anti-national sensibility among our cosmopolitan progressive elites and young people. Closely linked to these denationalizing tendencies, <clears throat> pardon me, is the ideology of multiculturalism, with its celebration not so much of America's historic achievements, traditions, and common culture, but rather of its diversity, defined in racial, ethnic, and gendered terms. This brings us to the phenomenon of the hour insurgent populism on the left and the right. In its simplest terms, populism, defined as the revolt of ordinary people against overbearing and self-serving elites, has long existed in American politics. In its most familiar form, populism has been left-wing in its ideology, targeting bankers, wealthy capitalists, and corporations as villains the millionaires and billionaires in Bernie Sanders' parlance in 2016. From Andrew Jackson's feud with the Second Bank of the United States in the 1830s to William Jennings Bryan's crusade against the gold standard in the 1890s, from Franklin Roosevelt's appeal to the forgotten man at the bottom of the economic pyramid, his words, in 1932, to the demagogic theatrics of Senator Huey Long and Father Charles Coughlin of Michigan in his early days during the Great Depression, populism has often been a left-wing phenomenon, vocalizing the anger of those at the bottom of the economic ladder toward those sitting pretty at the top. But populism in America has sometimes taken a conservative form as well particularly since 1945. In the early 1950s, Senator Joseph McCarthy and his conservative allies denounced liberal democratic politicians and pro-New Deal elites as dupes and even enablers of communist espionage and subversion at home and of communist aggrandizement abroad. In the 1960s, William F. Buckley Jr. famously declared that he would rather be governed by the first 2,000 names in the Boston telephone directory than by the entire faculty of Harvard University. <laughs> that is, Buckley, a college graduate himself, would rather trust the political judgment of less educated common people than of cosmopolitan and mostly left-wing intellectual elites. Criticism of an allegedly smug and decadent liberal establishment, always capitalized, became a staple of conservative discourse in the 1960s and persisted long thereafter. Populism conservative style achieved its greatest success after 1964 under the leadership of Ronald Reagan who brilliantly articulated a populistic libertarian aversion to meddlesome and unaccountable government, an aversion long ingrained in the American psyche. Consider these words from President Reagan's farewell address in 1989. He said, ours is the first revolution in the history of mankind that truly reversed the course of government. And with three little words, we the people, the first three words of the Constitution. We the people, he continued, tell the government what to do. It doesn't tell us. We the people are the driver. The government is the car. 
and what we decide where and we decide where it should go and by what route and how fast no conservative has ever said it better but notice the crucial distinction between these two manifestations of anti-elitism so long embedded in our politics Left-wing populism in America has traditionally aimed its fire at big money, the private sector elite entrenched on Wall Street. Right-wing populism of the Reaganite variety has focused its wrath on big government, the public sector elite ensconced in Washington. Left-wing populism was most popular in America in the 19th and early 20th centuries, when powerful financiers and captains of industry appeared to control the nation's destiny. Right-wing populism gained traction after the capitalist establishment was displaced by a competing establishment centered in the ever more bureaucratic administrative state and its allies in academe. A few years ago, American conservatives experienced a revival of Reaganite populistic fervor in the form of the Tea Party movement with its slogan, Don't Tread on Me. In some circles, there has been a tendency to dismiss this phenomenon as either the artificial creation of right-wing billionaires or as the ugly expression of the racial anxieties of white people. The truth, I think, is more complicated. In the wake of the Great Recession of 2008 and the federal government's response to it, a powerful conviction arose among virtually all conservatives that public policy in the United States had in some profound way gone off the rails. Rightly or wrongly, conservatives at the grassroots increasingly believed that ours had become a government not of and by the people, but only for the people. Government by autocratic edict from above. The leftward lurch of the Obama administration, exemplified by the Affordable Care Act of 2010, was not, it soon transpired, the only source of Tea Party discontent. And this is crucial. The populist conservative revolt of 2009 and 10 quickly morphed into a bitter struggle, not only against the perceived external threat from the left, but also against a perceived internal threat from the conservative movement's imperfect political vehicle, the Republican Party. Despite massive Republican victories in the congressional elections of 2010 and 2014, many Tea Party populists felt betrayed by what they saw as the inability and even worse, the unwillingness of elected Republican officials in Washington to fight effectively for the conservative agenda. Many at the grassroots, encouraged by populist sympathizers on talk radio, began to suspect that some of their elected leaders were not merely cowardly or inept, but essentially on the other side of the political divide, particularly on the question of dealing with illegal immigration. The mounting frustration of grassroots conservatives, often derided by their critics as provincials and nativists, became part of the tinder, indeed the crucial tinder, for the firestorm that was about to occur. By late 2015, the perception that America's governing elites were no longer heeding the will of the people extended far beyond the Tea Party right. It helped to propel the improbable presidential candidacy of an outright socialist, Bernie Sanders. Until then, it appeared to me that the election of 2016 might become a showdown between these two competing brands of populism, the progressive anti-capitalist form and the conservative anti-statist one. Victory, I thought, would go to whichever political party better explained the causes of the Great Recession of 2008. 
and the years of malaise that followed. Free market capitalism, or statist progressivism, which is the problem? Which is the solution? On this perennial point of issue, the election would be decided. What I did not foresee before the summer of 2015 was the volcanic eruption of a new and even angrier brand of populism, a hybrid that we now call Trumpism. Politically, Trumpism's antecedents may be found in the presidential campaigns of Ross Perot and Patrick Buchanan for president in 1992 and 1996. Stylistically, much of the Trump campaign of 2016 recalled the turbulence and rough rhetoric of George Wallace's campaign rallies in 1968. Ideologically, Trumpism bears a striking resemblance to the anti-interventionist, anti-globalist, immigration restrictionist, and America first worldview propounded by various paleoconservatives during the 1990s and ever since. It is no accident that Buchanan, for example, was thrilled by Trump's candidacy and is one of his most ardent defenders today. But instead of focusing its anger exclusively on left-wing elites, as conservative populism in its Reaganite variant has done, the Trumpist brand of populism simultaneously assailed right-wing elites, including the Buckley-Reagan conservative movement that I described earlier. In particular, Trumpism dramatically broke with the proactive conservative internationalism of the Cold War era and with the pro-free trade supply-side economics ideology that Reagan embraced and that has dominated Republican Party policymaking since 1980. It thus posed not just a political challenge to the liberal establishment and a factional challenge to the Republican establishment, but an ideological challenge to the separate and distinct conservative establishment long headquartered at Buckley's National Review. The distinctiveness of Trumpism in 2016 was that it was assailing three establishments simultaneously. So what has been driving the Trump phenomenon? I believe we are witnessing a political phenomenon never before seen in this country, the attempted creation of an ideologically muddled nationalist populist major party combining both left-wing and right-wing elements. In its fundamental outlook and public policy concerns, if not always in its programmatic features, it seems akin to the National Front in France and similar protest movements that are gaining ground in Europe. Most of these insurgent parties abroad are conventionally labeled right-wing, but some of them are noticeably statist and welfare statist in their economics, as is Trumpism in certain respects. Nearly all of them are responding to persistent economic stagnation, massively disruptive global migration patterns, and terrorist fanatics with global designs and lethal capabilities. In pro-Brexit Britain and continental Europe, as well as America, the natives are restless, and for much the same reasons. Trumpism and its European analogs are also being driven by something else, a deepening conviction that the governing globalist elites have neither the competence nor the will to make things better. The rise of Trumpism in the past three years has laid bare a potentially dangerous chasm in American politics and European politics as well. Not so much between the traditional left and right, but rather, as someone has put it, between those above and those below on the socioeconomic and cultural scale. In Donald Trump, many of those below have found a voice for their despair and outrage at what they consider to be the cluelessness 
and condescension of their betters. Facilitating the Trumpist revolt of the masses is a revolutionary transformation of the structure and velocity of mass communication, another facet of the phenomenon we call globalization. In the past, upsurges of populist sentiment in America have often coincided with innovations in communications technology that rendered the voices of the little people more discernible and easier to mobilize. The populistic 1890s, for example, witnessed the dawn of sensationalized yellow journalism. One of its pioneers was a flamboyant newspaper mogul, William Randolph Hearst, a millionaire Democrat living in New York City who tried to become president in 1904. Does that perhaps remind you of anyone? In our own time, the spectacular efflorescence of talk radio, cable news networks, the internet, smartphones, and social media have radically enhanced the so-called power in the people and diminished the ability of elites to control and manipulate public opinion. In 2015 and 2016, the success of Donald Trump owed much to his masterful exploitation of these relatively new media, including two, Facebook and Twitter, that did not exist a mere 15 years ago. It is noteworthy that the three most prominent and comparatively highbrow conservative organs rooted in the print journalism era, National Review, Commentary, and the Weekly Standard, were centers of outspoken resistance to Trump. While some of the most popular conservative talk radio hosts and internet websites supported him with zeal. As globalization accelerates in cyberspace and elsewhere, it has become plain that the United States is experiencing a potentially profound political and cultural realignment, pitting in the words of social scientists, globalist and transnational progressive elites against those who style themselves nationalists and populists. In the past two years, the tensions on these fault lines have flared into a struggle for the mind and soul of American conservatism. As the debate has proceeded, many conservative intellectuals have been attempting to accommodate what they see as the valid grievances expressed by Trump's supporters. According to the libertarian social scientist Charles Murray, the central truth of Trumpism is that, in his words, the entire American working class has legitimate reasons to be angry at the ruling class, Murray's words. Conservative intellectuals in general now seem inclined to agree. But the problem for conservatives goes much deeper than expressing sympathy for the grievances of the aggrieved. If Trumpism were simply the anguished cry of a sector of the population that feels left behind economically, it would seem possible for conservative leaders in Congress to hammer out legislation that would begin to address the sources of anxiety. To some extent, they succeeded in doing so in the tax bill they enacted last year. Three obstacles, however, stand in the path of a smooth and total accommodation. The first is that the contest between Trumpism and its conservative and Republican critics has become not just a dispute over economics and details of public policy, but a battle of paradigms, intellectual paradigms, a conflict of visions not easily papered over by pragmatic compromise. To many of its conservative critics, Trumpism is little more than a mishmash of protectionist, nativist, and in foreign policy, neo-isolationist impulses, a distasteful throwback to the world before 1945. To the Trumpists, conservative internationalism is a rusty relic of a bygone Cold War era, and Wall Street Journal-style supply-side economics with its corollaries of free trade, open borders, and uncapped immigration, is an ossified dogma whose real-world consequences 
have been catastrophic for globalization's losers, especially in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania. For many years during the Reagan era and beyond, the leading exponent of supply-side economics in Washington was the late Representative Jack Kemp. Today, Kemp's chief political disciple, who in fact once worked for him as a speechwriter, is none other than the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, a man who has shown no signs of moderating his fundamentally Kempian worldview. Meanwhile, President Trump's former chief ideologist and strategist, Stephen Bannon, proudly calls himself an economic nationalist, intent on building what he has called, quote, an entirely new political movement, unquote. The conservatives, he has said, are going to go crazy. It is not easy to see how at the level of principle and theory, Kempism and Trumpism can be reconciled. In short, Trumpism as a body of populist sentiments has been boldly challenging the fundamental tenets and perspectives of every component of the post-1945 conservative coalition described in my remarks tonight. In its perspective on free trade, Trumpism deviates sharply from the limited government pro-free market philosophy of the libertarians and classical liberals. Despite useful support for the right to life and religious freedom, including the freeing of Pastor Brunson from a Turkish jail last weekend, and from its criticism of political correctness, Trumpism, I would say on the whole, has shown relatively little interest in the religious, moral, and cultural concerns of the traditionalists and social conservatives. In foreign policy, it has harshly criticized interventionist conservative internationalism grounded in the Cold War era, as well as the so-called hard Wilsonianism and anti-Putinism of national security hawks and neoconservatives. What Trumpism continues to address, loudly and insistently, is the insecurity and disorientation both economic and cultural, that large numbers of grassroots conservatives and others now feel about conditions at home. Whether this attentiveness to the travails of ordinary Americans will be enough to bridge the legislative gap and ideological gap between Trump and congressional Republican leaders remains to be seen. Trump has the biggest megaphone and the ardent support of most of the conservative base. But at the elite level of governance in Washington, the conflict of visions is unresolved, particularly over the crucial issue of immigration. The second hurdle that Trumpist populism faces is the polarizing character and temperament of the man who has become its vessel and champion. Last year, shortly after the presidential inauguration, I visited Japan where I had been invited to lecture about the history and current configuration of American conservatism. One day during the trip, I was treated in Kyoto to an elaborate tea ceremony presided over by a Buddhist monk. As we exchanged pleasantries with the aid of an interpreter, suddenly I heard the words, Donald Trump. Donald Trump, the monk inquired, will he be a king or a joker? It is a disquieting question, and more than a year later, the answer for many Americans remains unclear. Many years ago, an American humorist was asked what he thought about the music of the German composer Wagner. He replied that it is better than it sounds. <laughs> Perhaps Americans who are concurrently ambivalent about Trump will eventually decide that, like Wagner's music, Trumpism is better than it sounds. Increasing numbers of conservatives are now taking this position as they point to specific actions that Trump is taking that they approve of. But whatever conservatives think of Trump's policies, it is a sobering fact that nearly two years into his tenure, Trump himself 
has yet to receive the approval of a clear majority of the American people in the opinion polls. This is, I believe, unprecedented in the modern history of the American presidency, and it is not a harbinger of sunny weather ahead. The final obstacle to the success of Trumpism may be the most daunting of all. The intrinsic nature of populism itself as a form of political action. Although populist attitudes and sentiments have long been present in American politics, major outbreaks of populist agitation have tended to be spasmodic and relatively brief. In part, this is because the most spectacular populist revolts in American history have generally occurred in times of great economic dislocation, as in the 1890s and 1930s. Once the economy has improved, however, the populist clamor has tended to subside. In part also, it is because historically, American populism has almost always been a reactive phenomenon. And those doing the reacting at the grassroots are almost by definition people who are not engaged in politics on a daily basis unlike the elites against whom they rebel. Sooner or later, populist eruptions, like most volcanic eruptions, simmer down, and politics returns more or less to normal, that is, to rule by elites. For nervous conservatives, this raises urgent questions. How much time does Donald Trump have to steer the American ship of state in a different direction before the current populist tide recedes? Or will his enemies on the left, by their own excesses, keep his populist conservative base mobilized far beyond expectations and thereby save him from himself? As the midterm elections approach, it seems that this is happening. In the battle over Judge Kavanaugh, the American left has succeeded in galvanizing and largely reuniting the American right. Meanwhile, as the Washington merry-go-round spins with disorienting speed, various elements on the American right are attempting to provide an intellectual foundation for President Trump's sentiments and initiatives, a highbrow version of Trumpism, if you will. In their opposition to multiculturalism, elitist liberalism, globalist economics, uncontrolled immigration, and transnational progressivism, a number of conservative intellectuals have begun to question traditional free market economic theory and its corollaries, and to celebrate what a conservative scholar in a brand new book calls the virtue of nationalism. Whether this intellectual insurrection will reshape the conservative coalition permanently, no one can yet say. In conclusion, let me tell you a story. A number of years ago, I am told, a young member of the British Conservative Party was campaigning for a seat in Parliament. At a public rally, he zestfully defended the Tory platform and then concluded, these are our principles. If you do not like them, we have others. <laughs> this evening, I have offered you a smorgasbord of conservative principles, or more precisely, a historical framework for understanding the evolving intellectual landscape of American conservatism. On its face, the American conservative movement may appear to be an unstable alliance, especially in 2018, when the fissures and populistic pressures run deep. But for three generations now, it has also proven remarkably resilient, united in the last analysis by a recurrent sense of mortal challenge from the left. And that may be a key to conservatism's future in the months and years just ahead. We are living in a time of deepening rancor and ideological polarization in which politics is becoming an increasingly unbridled and tribalistic contest of wills. 
on the right and the left too. The assaultive and apocalyptic language of war is being used to mobilize political legions. Provocative words like resistance, secession, civil war, and silent coup are popping up more frequently in public discourse. In the meeting rooms and corridors of Congress and other public spaces in Washington, incidents of incivility and outright intimidation of elected officials are occurring. In this poisonous climate, the temptation is strong for partisans of the left and right to repair to their respective tribal barricades driven by the ceaseless drumbeat of the binary choice. But we are not quite there yet, and I hope we never will be. As conservatives and progressives, elitists and populists, globalists and nationalists chart their course, they should ponder the admonition years ago of the British statesman and conservative thinker Edmund Burke, who wrote, society cannot exist unless a controlling power upon will and appetite be placed somewhere. And the less of it there is within, the more there must be without. It is ordained in the eternal constitution of things that men of intemperate minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. Let us hope that Americans on all sides heed his words. Thank you. George, thank you for a, another magisterial overview of the conservative movement and our national temper right now. I want to point out to the audience that you will have the opportunity to pose a question, if you wish, uh, to Dr. Nash. You should have your card and just, you know, when you've got your question, then please hold it up. One of our workers will collect it, bring it up. and. Uh, I'm going to ask two or three questions in the meantime while you're composing your own thoughts and your own questions. George, I think a lot of people who've been conservative in the post-war era, who've voted Republican pretty consistently, I think a lot of them feel homeless. I think there's a sense in which the conservative movement that they knew has morphed so much that they don't recognize it. The conservative party that they knew has morphed so much it's not theirs anymore. And you have a lot of people who are migrating over to, you know, vote Democratic, or like George Will left the Republican Party. A lot of people who can no longer say when they go into the office in the morning, I'm a conservative. I mean, we know this is happening. And especially on college campus, you know, we hear about these stories all the time. So you're somebody who's studied this your entire adult life, you know, the conservative movement and the dramatic change it's going through. What do you tell these people who have this sense of homelessness? Well, I would point out that conservatives have argued, at least uh, before the last two years, that what they uphold, what they believe, are what are sometimes called permanent things or eternal truths. In other words, truths that do not go in, do not cease to be true because they go in and out of fashion. So one, one advice, bit of advice one might give to people wondering about where we are going uh, next is to bear in mind if the, such people are conservative that some of the principles and values uh, that were enunciated by these several different wings of the conservative movement as it developed after World War II, that those values conservatives would say remain true. That is to say a commitment to free market capitalism as opposed to statism, state control of the economy, uh, over-regulation and so forth, that remains true. Uh, a concern for national security as a valid uh, concern of the nation state remains true whether or not communism exists in the world or not. And a concern for basic safety at home and abroad is a constant of, of uh, a conservative desire and indeed of, of other American citizens as well. And also that the, the, the permanent 
values and truths embodied, many conservatives would say, in the Judeo-Christian religious and philosophical tradition do not somehow lose their validity because there's been an election cycle that seems to, to turn us uh, in a different uh, direction. And, and so that would be the first thing. Uh, a second point perhaps to notice is that for all of the sound and fury, there are certain elements of continuity between Trump and what came before. He doesn't put it in the same terms when he talks about making America great again or making America strong, but there is a concern for security, for protecting the American people from their enemies abroad. He might define those enemies differently in a new context, and that's you know, subject to great debate. Was he too soft on Putin or not? What about China? It would seem to me, incidentally, based on recent uh, events in the last week or two, that the Trump administration is really orienting itself toward a much harder line toward China. And that is something I think to watch for. And that might be something that conservatives and other Americans concerned about uh, Chinese uh, industrial espionage and, and things like that would uh, be um, in agreement on. So it may be that Trump, for all of the manners and, and the different tone and the different kinds of rhetoric uh, and the factors that distance some people from him, they would find that he, he or his party um, are, are enunciating things that they could still link up with. A bigger, yes? Well, what would you do, for example, with the evangelicals? I mean, yeah. I, I think you and I are, have been observers of American politics and the conservative movement for a long time. You can certainly understand why there was a sense of connectedness to Ronald Reagan. You know, in the 1980s, the evangelicals voted for him in swarms. But how do you explain evangelicals voting for Donald Trump? I will give you a one-word answer, and then I'll elaborate. Fear. I think that what drove the evangelical vote in the 2016 election to the point that if a higher percentage of evangelicals voted for Trump than for any other preceding candidate, it was over 80%, was a sense of fear of what would happen to the Christian communities of the United States if a state led by a Clinton administration were to become more deeply embedded, turning the courts in a, a direction that might lead to marginalization and possibly persecution of Christians. Uh, that led a lot of Christians, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you know, I wouldn't necessarily agree with all that analysis or whatever, but I'm saying I think as an analyst that that is fundamentally what drove uh, evangelicals to accept uh, a man who obviously did not uh, comport with the standards uh, that they had uh, believed in as, as people of faith. Now, is that all an abstract fear? Not exactly. Uh, in 2015, I think it was, 2016, the Hobby Lobby case was before the Supreme Court. It was decided five to four. That emphasized the importance of having different Supreme Court justices to perhaps tilt the balance in another direction. The Little Sisters of the Poor case was on its way up. Um, Catholic institutions were under pressure uh, to give um, insurance policies that cover abortifacients, for example. Catholics, I think, were part of this swing, and I, I think the swing occurred largely in the last three weeks of the election, as many wavering Christians of different denominations uh, decided that, that they would take their chances with Trump rather than allow a government to be in place that might begin to impinge through regulation on faith-based educational institutions. There have been signs of that. Uh, the whole abortion controversy and its, and its manifestations was very much a live issue. You may remember some of you, you that in one of the debates, I think the second debate, presidential debate, Trump made a strong statement in opposition to partial birth abortion. I have some anecdotal reason to think, and I think that there is some truth, broader truth to it, that his answer was sufficient to convince a number of wavering Catholics to vote with him. So again, I go come back to that word. They were deeply, I think, sincerely apprehensive that a secular state run by a Democratic Party, much of whose base now is aggressively secularist, would impose regulations and port appointments and other policies that would have the effect of putting people of faith in positions where they might feel morally challenged, morally compromised. And so they took the chance, and of course Trump 
whatever else one says about him, has been astute enough to realize that that's a ma major part of his base at the present time in voting terms, and he has uh, rewarded them, if you will, put it in political terms, with Supreme Court appointments and other policies, including reversal of certain Obama-era executive orders that have very much pleased social conservatives. So while it may seem, and it does on its first face seem very, um, uh, problematic or, or, or surprising that this kind of, of thing would would happen this this voting block moving in the in this way I think I've given you what I would regard as a, at least a partial explanation as to why it could happen because it was a fear that this was somehow an existential crisis you couldn't wait for four years to have the swing of the election cycle uh, this was the Flight 93 election, as a conservative polemicist put it, famously arguing that it's now or never, that uh, things could go too far and be irretrievable from a conservative, and a particularly a religious conservative point of view, if one allowed the Obama-era policies to go one more term under a Clinton administration. So I think that explains a lot. And there is still ambivalence, obviously, and dislike uh, of, of Trump on the basis of, 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 of his manners and demeanor and so forth among evangelicals. Now, some of you may know better than I, but I have heard occasionally stories that there are faith leaders who meet with him at times and are trying to kind of coax him uh, in, in that direction. I don't know how accurate that is. Uh, but I do think that that sense uh, that things were going to get very bad very quickly was what motivated people of that persuasion to get out and vote in such disproportionate numbers as they did. Well, you know, you've been talking about the strife, including uh, the talk of a civil war. I was doing some research uh, this summer, and on June 27th, there was a Rasmussen poll that showed that 31% of Americans think that within five years, the United States will be in a civil war. I'm not talking metaphorically here. You know, I'm talking about a real civil war of some kind. Now, it wouldn't look like the Civil War of the 1860s, where you have you know, masses of soldiers fighting over no man's land and moving through big swaths of territory. It'd be more that, for example, Antifa would attack institutions on the right. Uh, uh, you would have the alt-right attacking institutions on the left, more, more akin to a guerrilla war. So that leads to the question, George. You, you, uh, very provocatively suggested in a conversation we've had recently that you thought that the culture war is heating up and that it is specifically a post-Christian culture war. Please elaborate on what you mean okay, by that. Yes. Well, as I think this audience probably knows quite well, for the past 30 or 40 years, we have been in what are called culture wars in this country, going back to the 60s, usually um, around issues uh, of abortion, uh, the, the definition of marriage, uh, drug use, maybe gun control to some degree, uh, issues that involve the, the deepest moral and theological convictions of a substantial sector of the American electorate. That sector of the electorate uh, feels that it is losing, and, or maybe has lost, the culture wars defined in those ways. And so what they have been hoping for is a kind of, at, at least le leaving Christians alone, all right, we now have the, this and that, but uh, don't, don't impose um, moral choices on people of faith who are, in a sense, wanting to draw back and are feeling extremely defensive. The Colorado Baker case is, a point, okay, uh, is an instance in point, decided by the Supreme Court on somewhat peripheral and technical grounds, five to four, with Justice Kennedy making the deciding vote just a few months ago, for example. So um, these are the culture wars that we've lived through for a long time. And it would seem that on, on key issues like legalization of marijuana, which is now legal in my state of Massachusetts and in several other states, and would seem to be, seem to be going, going in that direction, same-sex marriage is a federal legal reality. Uh, abortion continues to be largely uh, uh, unregulated. Uh, and so on those issues, the people who care deeply about them feel that they have, in a sense, lost the battle. And the best that they can do is more or less be left alone to, with their own communities, their own children, their own school systems, and so on, be left alone by this larger antithetical culture. What I, I'm afraid may be happening now is that we're, we may be moving into a kind of new kind of culture war, 
and this is an, a judgment that I have come to on my own, but I've discovered, I think it's Peter Beinart, a liberal author, has made some similar remarks in an article some months ago. And that is, we now have identity politics set front and center, and all the friction that goes with that over microaggressions and, and so forth, and what you can and cannot say. And the other issues basically were more or less theological issues, but identity issues are even harder, it seems to me, to sort out uh, because you cannot, there's no appeal to a common moral belief system or value system or something of that nature or accommodation. Uh, and on the, you know, on the alt right, which I think is a pretty small fringe, but I find it repugnant, the racist alt right, there is a push for defining identity in terms of white racism, white nationalism, identitarianism. Uh, kind of an alternative word for that. And on the left, there are many you know, variations as well. And we have seen of late, just quite recently now, uh, the increasing usage of the term white male privilege in the public discourse. Kavanaugh, Judge Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, was accused of that. I, I couldn't understand why the word white was included in that, because there were no people of color involved in the whole issue of his, of his past and his conduct. But that is being pushed from elements of the American left. And that is, I fear, going to radicalize some white people to think, OK, well, if you want to play the game of identitarianism on the left, then we'll do the same thing. And so you end up with a kind of Hobbesian situation, a uh, kind of a, a, of a, a very tense atmosphere, where uh, people cannot get along very well if, they're identif if they regard their identity as being challenged by your existence, you see, uh, or vice versa. So it strikes me that identity politics is a, uh, more of a zero-sum game than we have been able to get, say, through the civil rights movement, which you may remember, in its early phases anyway, was a religiously oriented movement. Martin Luther King was the Reverend Martin Luther King. Southern Baptist ministers, black pastors, and so on were, were part of this movement, which appealed to the larger majority of Americans on religious and values dr driven from faith uh, to, to make a social change, and it came about. And I don't see now that we're in a situation where the Republican Party is the party of the religious right and the Democratic Party is increasing the party of the secular left, how you're going to have a kind of common ground conversation that can resolve these tensions, and especially if you have everybody kind of confrontationally identifying themselves in terms of race, color, gender orientation, whatever, it seems to me it's going to be harder to have a society uh, where civility can prevail. So that's what I mean where I say we might be entering a kind of post-Christian phase of these, this unending uh, culture war, and I, I think it has uh, a very worrisome possibilities. Well, it's an interesting question because some of our speakers at the Helen Stein Center, as you know, uh, Andrew Hartman, for example, have actually written books saying that the uh, culture wars are essentially over. So I, I think uh, that thesis is pretty much thrown out the window at this point. Uh, the culture war agree. is not over. Yeah. Okay, so Trump has had a huge impact. You've spoken very eloquently on the impact on the conservative movement and on the GOP. Well, let's talk about now what is, what is Trump's impact on liberalism, progressivism, yes. for its core, at its core. Well, it seems like for several de de presidencies now we have syndromes. You heard about Bush derangement syndrome, Obama derangement syndrome, and now Trump derangement syndrome. It seems that the hostility ha can go to excess for a, a lot of reasons that we might discuss. Um, I think that one thing that has happened to the left, and I think, I think it could lead them in a very mistaken path, is to argue to them, among themselves that, well, what they need is their Trump. The left needs its Trump. Yeah. You heard it here first, folks. And that's, you know, Michael Avenatti, the lawyer, you know who he is, it, it seems to think that, and he's been saying as much, as this celebrity lawyer of sorts, uh, has been saying that, uh, that what you need to do is be more in your face. So he can be down in, down in the pit with Trump as much. And there is that temptation, and some, and it's been reported in the New York Times and elsewhere in the past few weeks since the Kavanaugh uh, a, a case, that some on the left are saying that they feel, the Democrats feel that they've been too nice and they've been, been rolled by the Republicans. Now, the Republicans tell you just the opposite. So each side has this very you know, fearful and negative stereotype of the other. 
And so one thing that I think has, uh, has happened to the American left is that it has felt so appalled uh, and, and maybe threatened in so, many, in so many different ways by his policies, his manners, and so forth, that they, they feel that the way they can get attention and rally is to si sort of be uh, equally as vocal. Um, I, if I may just elaborate on one, to make a, a point on this. I, sure. I have, I would, I hope this will not sound partisan, but I, I make it as an analytical observation. I think the Democrats, as I look back on it as a historian, historians don't usually like to write about history until it's been gone for a while, because otherwise you can get, you get caught up in the, the moods of the moment and so on. So I, I, I say that, give that in preface. But I think what would have happened if after the election of 2016, the Democratic leaders had said to Trump, look, we don't like you and you don't like us, but you are now the president and we are going to try to find some common ground. And hey, how about a deal on infrastructure and a deal on DACA and so on? Some of that was done, but they were under such pressure, it appears, from their base not to compromise that the possibility of working with Trump that way didn't really materialize. Now, there are a lot of other factors that I can't get into. But I think Trump, having been elected outside the conservative movement, taking a kind of hostile takeover of the Republican Party with the vote of his supporters, of course, uh, that Trump might have been very tempted to be the great deal maker. You know? And he did that at one point, as you may recall, during the second half of 2017, when the Republicans were kind of twiddling their thumbs on Capitol Hill, or so it seemed, Trump was getting frustrated, the tax bill was not going very fast, and the Obamacare wasn't being repealed. And he called in uh, Democratic leaders as well as Republicans, and he ostentatiously started calling Schumer and Pelosi Chuck and Nancy. And there was this little charm offensive for a week or two on Trump's part. So he, I think that in, if they had played it a little differently, they might have tempted him into some compromises that might have caused heartburn to the Republicans. And also heartburn to their base, right? Their base probably uh, and so would their, not have, their own base would have been unhappy with, with, with their being compromising and right. not being combative enough. So the incentive from below on the left is to be combative. Um, I think that, that the, the leaders, maybe they had no choice, but the, the, there might have been an opportunity there which would have led to a very different dynamic in the last year and a half. Uh, and the Republicans and conservatives might have been uh, very uneasy about Trump. The second point I'd make along these same lines, that I think that the, the Democrats seem to be taking uh, from the Kavanaugh controversy the lesson that they should be as aggressive and and, and, and confrontational as they see the Republicans as being. As I said at the end of my speech, I think the immediate effect of that has been to revive the Republican right at a time when that populist momentum was sort of simmering down and it looked like Republicans were not that enthusiastic about the election and the, coming, the midterms coming up and that the Democrats might have a, a, a tremendous victory, which conceivably might still happen, I, I can't predict. But it does seem from the anecdotal evidence that you probably have seen on TV and read about and so on, that the, that the Democrats, by their own tactics and the tactics of those in the corridors, you know, confronting Senator Flake in an elevator, chasing said Senator Cruz out of a restaurant, on and on and on, you know, sending some very disparaging uh, comments to Senator Collins while she was making up her mind on the nomination. That had the effect of making the Republican senators feel embattled, and it created a sense of teamwork consciousness, if you will, among them. And I, I know that it has uh, uh, enraged, outraged, many, many conservatives, people that I know or read, read uh, their blogs and things like that. So uh, on two occasions, the Democrats may have overplayed their hand. Now, one never knows when Trump might come out with a, you know, some kind of a tweet or whatever that will put him back in the center. It has been said, and I'll just stop with this comment, that Trump's poll numbers, which have never hit 50 in a, in a except for the Rasmussen poll a few times, but that seems to be an outlier. The general average of polls never has him hitting 50%. It tends to edge upward when he's not quite as much in the news. <laughs> but when he, injects himself in some way that, the, and then you, the Democrats get on TV and, and some never Trumpers, Republicans, and will denounce him, and then he sl slides down again. Um, and I'll, I'll just stop at that point. So I think that, uh, just to sum up, that, uh, the, that 
you have to, you, both sides have to play tactically uh, to, to win, and the Democrats may have, made, may have made those two mistakes, and there are any number of Republican mistakes that we could talk about too, but that, to answer your Well, question. you've done a good job of answering, really, just about all the questions here. There's one question, though, here that has not been handled yet. Three weeks from tonight, we'll be looking at returns, uh, midterm <laughs> elections, and I know you're a historian, not a prophet, uh -oh. but what do you think is going to be happening? What? <laughs> And play out maybe a scenario or two, and this will be our last question. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as a historian, I, 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 I find it hard enough to understand the past, let them know in the future. You know? <laughs> but um, that having been said, um, it would seem, and again, I'm inferring from evidence that's available, accessible to all. I, I don't have any contacts at the White House or whatever. Um, like th something like that would give me inside information, not privy to the rest of us. It would seem that the Republicans are likely to hold the Senate. It would seem that the House is very much uh, in doubt. It could go a few seats either way. Any number of elections could require recounts in House districts and so forth. We might not even know uh, on election night for certain if there are, say, five or six seats and it's that close. It would seem to be uh, that the Republicans are are probably going to hold on to the Senate and maybe increase, maybe conceivably even more than we think, depending upon that so-called Kavanaugh effect and how many of the Republican base uh, gets charged up enough to vote. The Democrats, we know, are energized highly and well-organized and very well-funded, So they, and there, there are many historic reasons to give them a, a the, the benefit of the doubt, that is, the tendency ought to be in their direction, uh, but uh, there are still potentially October surprises for the next three weeks that could change uh, you know, the sentiments at the last moment. It all comes down, obviously, to those who vote. I have wondered whether Trump would be effective in the tactic that he's using of going to all these rallies, because Obviously, he reminds his followers in the third district or whatever it is in Kentucky that uh, there's an election coming up, but he also re <laughs> reminds all of his opponents who happen to see him on TV while he's in town uh, that there's an election coming up. So, so he has the effect of driving up the vote on both sides, potentially. But he does seem to bring out a very loyal, dedicated following that has not been um, is likely to vote Republican. So here's one thing I'll leave you with in closing. A poll that I saw not long ago said, 80% of the voters for Trump in 2016 voted for Romney in 2012. So sort of standard habitual Republican votes, you might say. But 20% did not, and who were they? They were, we think, the so-called Reagan Democrats of days of yore, people who do not have a Republican Party identification or history in their voting record, but who voted for Trump for all sorts of reasons. The big question I have is, can Trump through his rallies reach those people and get them to vote Republican even though he's not on the ballot as a name? And I don't know. I think it's possible that it, it, the Republicans could hold on. I think it's possible, maybe slightly more than possible, that the Democrats would just eke their way over the top in the House. But that is, um, uh, I think, uh, almost an unanswerable uh, issue, and it, it shows how, I guess, how deeply polarized we remain. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give George Nash a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, George, you've been with us for a number of times. Uh, you've been on the stage, and you always go home back to Massachusetts with some swag, some Ralph yeah. Einstein swag. Well, so you, you got you got some new swag here. We got <laughs> lots of goldfish crackers for you. <laughs> Andy's mints. We're nonpartisan here. And uh, I just want to say thank you very much for well, all the ways that you well, thank you, contributed to our understanding tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Right, thank you. Thank you.